I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember it so you don't have to. And welcome to another rendition of WTR, aka, Was That Real? This is where we look at TV that was forgotten by some, but remembered by others for just how strange they were. With that said, we all love Dr. Seuss's timeless characters of the Cat in the Hat and the Grinch. So much so that some people even watch this bullshit. But did you know there was a time when they actually did a crossover? It's gone by a couple names over the years. The Grinch Grinches the Cat in the Hat, the Cat in the Hat gets Grinched, which both sound like children's intros to sexual harassment. But what everyone called it when I was growing up was the Grinch versus the Cat in the Hat. Because really, that's what it is. It's two popular characters in the same universe finally meeting up and, well, surviving each other. This seems kind of strange for Dr. Seuss, who didn't really do crossover battles. That kind of stuff would usually be associated with something like, say, a Marvel production. Well, funny you should think that, because this actually was made by Marvel Productions. Yeah, soon the Lorax and Sam I Am are gonna fight over the warring nations of the Sneetches and the Whos, with a cameo by Spider-Man we've all been waiting for. This was advertised everywhere when it came on TV, and to its credit, it's really not a bad idea. It's kind of like Batman vs. Superman. Yeah, you're funny. There you go! Where there's two seemingly opposite protagonists who also seem to have a lot in common. Both are agents of anarchy. They like to disrupt the status quo and take people out of their comfort zones. The reasons, though, is what makes them enemies. One does it to lighten the mood and open up possibilities, while the other does it to ruin the mood and limit possibilities. Even the lessons have a different spin. With the cat in the hat, he's the one dispensing the moral. With the Grinch, he's the one learning the moral. So it seems like there was just enough in common and just enough different to make this really, really good, right? Well, as much as I've praised Seuss in the past, even I have to admit not everything was perfect. Nothing was awful, but some ideas were better as just that, ideas. And for what it's worth, this does seem to have a lot of ideas, especially for kids. It just didn't seem to have a lot of focus. Again, a tough combination as Cat in the Hat was a somewhat random and archaic story where Grinch had a very solid beginning, middle, and end. Which makes this a very tricky combination. The Grinch as well was already used twice, with a Halloween special after the Christmas debut but didn't exactly get the strongest reaction. So it was tough to figure out if he could work in other tales outside of his first one. The story? The Grinch wakes to the voice of the Schmucker's Jelly Guy describing the morning. Never before had this nasty old guy leapt out of his bed with a smile in his eye and whistled, hello. Well, I could kill kids with a pitchfork and you'd still love my voice. However, the Grinch goes back to his evil ways when his mirror yells at him. I see nothing to whistle about. Yeah, like I said, kind of odd. Mirror convinces him to go out and cause trouble. And this is where he literally bumps into the cat in the hat, who makes the apparent mistake of calling him Greenface. Any inconvenienceities that I may have caused you, Mr. Greenface? Mr. Greenface? That is our word. So the Grinch decides to chase him down, create a machine that messes with reality, and just kind of annoy him. It's kind of a downgrade compared to his other adventures. First he wants to rob people the joys of giving, then he wants to terrify the world with fear from hellish looking monsters. Now he's just kind of a troll. In fact, you could argue he's literally the world's first internet troll. Think about it, he uses his computer to hack your everyday life to mildly annoy you. And he's the only one that finds it funny at all. Guess he's sort of a pioneer of obnoxiousness when you think about it. And that brings about the most horrible things. I'll admit, it's a little odd to see the cat in the hat constantly duped and get more and more frustrated as it goes on. It's kind of like seeing Groucho Marx get mad, or Radical Edward get mad, or the Roadrunner get mad. There's just some creations you always think are going to be comfortable and in control of their world. Which makes it a little off-putting when you see they don't always have the smart answer. It really cracks me up when he flat out calls the Grinch a psychopath. That Grinch, that psychopathic Grinch! How funny is that? There's a Dr. Seuss story where somebody uses the word psychopath! That's insane! Or psychopathic, I guess. To be fair though, only a psychopath would change the pronunciation of words to make them rhyme. The sounds that you make are the sounds of my choice. I can make you sound better or make you sound worse. Cheater! Are you feeling pretty good? 
Mr. Cat in the Hoot. Goot and who? Why were you changing that? They already rhymed! This all comes to a head when the Grinch uses his machine to mess with a restaurant for really no reason than to give Seuss an excuse to say he took LSD for inspiration. Yep, this is another Dr. Seuss trip out scene that doesn't connect to much, but who cares? It's a Dr. Seuss trip out scene. I will totally endorse getting a minor drunk if it leads to another pink elephant sequence. Screw priorities, I want a trip out, man. Look at this, he's going against the lesson of his own books. Green eggs are okay, but polka dot eggs? Chuck that shit. But to be fair, maybe the cat in the hat's frustration ties into the kinda sorta message. Yeah, even the moral is a little hard to grasp but I still can't say it's really wrong in any way. Amongst his frustration, he finally realizes that the way to win is not killing by anger, but killing by kindness. He goes to the Grinch's house and reminds him of his mother. Even a Grinch had a mother who taught him of love. Thank God he happened to have a good relationship with her because it eventually softens him up and makes him good again. He even has an inner monologue with her, which the more I think about it, strangely happens a lot in this. Half of the special is technically just people talking to themselves. Everyone's a psychopath! So I guess the message centers around... power of motherhood? To always bring family into everything? That a person's weakness is in their heart? It's confusing. Nevertheless, it is still a kinda nice, albeit unfocused scene leading to a relatively harmless ending. And that's really the best way I can describe this special. Nice, unfocused, but harmless. It's certainly not Seuss's strongest work, and truth be told, it could have been a bit more interesting. But it's still neat seeing two of his most famous characters meet and interact off each other. While the story's not the best, it still feels like this is what the characters would do and say if they ever did run into one another. So it's kind of fun to watch, if only for that reason. Yeah, it's pointless, yeah, it doesn't always make sense, but sometimes, that's okay. It's still creative, still strange, and still unmistakably Seuss. You can still get it on DVD and witness all the goofiness or psychotic tendencies yourself. Give it a buy and see one of the most surreal crossovers ever devised. I'm the Nostalgia Critic, I remember, so you don't have to. Coming next week, it's Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed, the death of Alicia Silverstone's career. But you can see it now under Vessel's ad-free early access. Just $3 a month to see tons of people's videos early, as well as a bunch of other extra features. Check it out and get the early scoop. Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out and this week we're doing one you might not think about that much but it's still very very important the guide dog foundation this organization has been around since 1946 and their mission is simple to provide guide dogs and training free of charge to people who are blind or visually impaired for 70 years, the Guide Dog Foundation has trained and placed guide and service dogs to provide increased independence, enhanced mobility, and companionship to people who are blind, have low vision, or have other disabilities. Once they make the decision to get an assistance dog, applicants become a part of the Foundation's open and welcoming community. They're supported with an uncompromised commitment from highly empathetic and certified trainers. They pair each student with the dog that's right for them, and the power of their bond makes the strongest of friendships. Crossing the street independently becomes a moment of liberation and trust. Traveling alone becomes a welcome adventure. Embracing new experiences becomes an everyday occurrence. It costs over $50,000 to breed, raise, train, and place one assistance dog. However, all of the Foundation's services are provided at no charge to the individual. Funding comes from the generosity of people like you, corporations, foundations, businesses, and many more. So definitely take a look, watch some of their videos, and see how you can help give sight to someone who needs it the most.